Um, okay, so I think we're starting. There we go. Okay, cool. That was weird. Uh, okay, so uh, the question of the week um, we, we looked at last uh, time, or I, I asked last week. Um, yeah, was uh, what difference exists between domination, denominations and does it matter? Now, we're actually not going to look at this today. Um, I wanted to bring it back up, those to, to remind you, and I'm going to add to it at the end of this lesson. Uh, I wanted to give you guys a long time to think about this question because next week is, is kind of, um, in my opinion, it, it is kind of important to look at this stuff. And, you know, it's stuff that, uh, we've been kind of him hawing around for a long time. You know, we looked at the cults. We're going to look at the cults um, like next month or something like that. You know, which kind of leaves us in this limbo with what about what about the denominations? Like, right. what's the difference? Does it matter? That kind of stuff. So I really want you guys to look at this. And if you have any specific questions about specific traditions or about specific denominations, please ask them through the course of either sending me a message. No, no don't send me a message. I am testing for my personal Facebook, so I'm only getting on the AMs to update it, and I don't check the notifications of the messages or any of that stuff, so don't do that. <laughs> Put it in the question box, or text me, um, and I will make sure you're included next week, okay? Um, where is the question box? It's down there in the corner. <laughs> yeah. I'm feeling alone. Yeah. Alone and malnourished. It feeds on your questions. It's dying of starvation, people. <laughs> okay. So, um, <clears throat> tonight we're going to look at something that is, has been near and dear to my heart uh, to, to, to really um, guide the discussion. I've chosen to use this book, Waking the Dead. It's by John Eldridge. I encourage you to check it out. Um, I'm actually doing a study uh, chapter by chapter for the worship team um, off this book starting on Saturday. Um, as far as uh, to review the book before we are going too far, um, he really doesn't have have a very good grasp of scripture, so you're going to have to not take this as a final authority, you know, and kind of just look at the idea of what he's saying without necessarily watching how he got there. Because he's got great things to say, he just uses allegory, he misquotes scripture to do it, and but the things that he says is good, he just, I don't like how he got there. <laughs> Uh, and then he has this whole thing at the end about spiritual warfare where he just goes way out there into the dark realm. Um, I've already ta taught lessons on spiritual warfare, so um, if you do read this and you get kind of confused, you can feel free to ask. You can feel free to listen to those messages. But there's that. So I am not condoning everything that's said in the book. I'm condoning the idea of the book, okay? All right? Now, that's a hard line to draw, but I'm drawing it. So uh, in, in our Christian life, as le at least for as long as I've been a part of the church, there's been this kind of just-get-through mindset. You know what I mean? As um, long as I've been in church. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's been prevalent for, for a very long time. Uh, and it's the <clears throat> idea of this, you know, it, just power through until the end. Just pray till Jesus comes. Pretty much. And in fact, most of the time, it, it, um, you, hear, you hear the same people um, with the same attitudes shown in different ways. You'll see, you'll see some people who are hopeless about the situation showing zeal. You know, like, ah, well, God's going to strike him down. You know, and, and that zeal is based off of their hopelessness in the situation. Usually. Not all the time, but usually. Or you see them take that, take that hopelessness of the situation, just get depressed and withdrawn. Don't, don't go to church anymore, just kind of withdraw from stuff. Um, it's, it's really the same root hopelessness just shown itself in different areas. And for that, I kind of want to look at, at, at the lyrics for a um, Mercy Me song. Uh, it's the first verse of it. It says, Before I knew how this all goes, trying to get through life, till you get called home, then came you, heaven has begun, eternity is now, not when this life's done. And the idea is um, you don't have to wait to have the joy of the Lord. You don't have to wait to have hope. That's something that can happen now. You know, um, our prayers do matter, our, our lives do matter, and this is something that, that just kind of is brushed over. And it's kind of been made worse by the last generation of preachers because they just kind of tried to instill fear in everybody with the rapture, and then they just kind of glossed over everything with, you know, God's going to strike them down. Right. You know, and, and Johnny Cashman sent the songs that literally says, God's going to cut you down. <laughs> so... Um, <clears throat> Some common statements that, that, that people say 
um, that is, is really, I think, summarizes the, this mindset. This life is full of disappointments. You know, why hope? You're just gonna, it's just gonna be. You're just gonna lose your hope. Uh, life was never meant to be happy, so just get used to get, just get used to the defeat. Uh, just wait until I die. If I can just make it another day. <laughs> Well, when Jesus comes back, well, these aren't the mindsets that uh, that God wants us to have. I mean, it's good, you know, to be happy that Jesus will set things right. That's a good thing, but yeah. it's not a good thing to to just kind of abandon hope in the time being and just live in a state of constant despair. That's not, that's not a good thing. Um, have you ever? So I want to ask this question. Actually, ask. It's not a rhetorical question. Uh, have you ever said something similar to this, or have you heard someone excuse uh, their their living hopeless? They, you know, uh, give an excuse for why they live hopeless. Either of those things. I'll start. Uh, one, one thing that I noticed, like I, I even said this when I, I was younger, like um, we were going to a church that it was. It was real old school, Pentecostal, and uh, it, it had like uh, like five or six old school Pentecostal pastors attending in that, like oh. attending this church, and uh, so they were all just kind of you know in their little uh, waiting for Jesus to come back club, yeah. and uh, like they they would sing the the hymns and stuff you know and. Like, all the hymns that they sing and stuff was basically the same theme that they were living up. And so one day I asked Grandma, I'm like, Grandma, what's up with this? Like, I mean, it's like, they don't have any joy here, you know? It's just like, well, when I die, I'll be happy, but yeah. right now life sucks, you know? And I mean, it was it was like that for years growing up. You know? mm -hmm. Just terrible. Good example. Anything else? I know my family sometimes gets into the it's nothing's ever going to get better kind of mood. Mm -hmm. If everything just starts going wrong, everybody's like, well, it's just not going to get any better. It's just going to continue to get worse. It's like, have some positivity. <laughs> right. Just a little bit of positivity. You know, one thing I find funny is the gospel means good news, <laughs> but when they all go around acting like Eeyore, like, <laughs> right. woe is me. <laughs> <laughs> No joke, we, we had a friend in uh, college who was called Eeyore, because he would never try anything because it was going to be bad. Why anyways. bother? Because <laughs> that way if I don't dream, I can never be disappointed. Exactly. exactly. Uh, if you, you never dream, that. you don't have to wake up from it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I saw that a lot growing up. A yeah. lot. Buddy. Any other examples of this? Where either you, uh, something you have said that's similar to that, or you have heard something, excuse for living for living all of this life. You know, I want to kind of assume here that this kind of an idea has gotten so ingrained in, in the Christian atmosphere, at least of America, that all of us kind of have this in us to a degree without even realizing sometimes that it's there. You know? Um, for instance, uh, one of the big things that, that I have a hard time with is I'm one of those people who feels like I can change the world! You know, but then when it comes to actually changing the community, it's like, ugh. you know what I mean? Um, it's like the OC Supertones song, you know. I w sometimes I feel like I could change the world, I just don't know where to start. <laughs> you know, and, and then you get kind of this, um, this almost like a hopelessness after doing ministry for a couple of years where you think every, it's just the same routine over and over again, you know. And then... Uh, Past that, if, if you get past it, if you make in the ministry past that, there's there's another stage that comes eventually, <laughs> uh, a stage that says, I am doing something, and I am accomplishing something, but it's not a one man show. I'm a part of a much larger team, and God's got everything under control. You know, but the problem is you have to stay in ministry for long enough <laughs> to come to that realization. <laughs> you know, uh, which is which is difficult. 
Because, like I said, this is so ingrained in the atmosphere of the church that we don't even realize that it's there. You know, um, you see worship leaders do this. You know, uh, what what's the good? You know, they're never going to worship God. It's always going to be me up here just making a fool of myself. You know, um, if I can use kids' church for example, kids' church leaders do this too. You know, uh, you know, every time I have a kid, they leave. Uh, youth groups too. I mean, one of the biggest complaints from youth pastors is, you know, they just won't come. <laughs> I, I get that. Really, uh, the only situation uh, in the modern church where the youth group is like very faithful is in the mega churches where their parents just kind of do it out of the rote, you know, uh, rote practices, you know, uh, rote memory, whatever you want to say. Uh, but this is kind of just something that, that that's always with us, and we excuse living hopeless. You know what I mean? Like, uh, especially when we've been dealt with extremely difficult times for extended periods of time. Um, physical illness, uh, unsafe family members, stuff like that. Things that, that, that weigh heavily on us and weigh heavily for an extended period of time. You know, we kind of just start to um, acknowledge things in our life that, that, that basically say, this is the excuse that allows me to live without hope. It's okay that I'm living like this because I have an excuse for this. And we don't consciously tell ourselves that. But yet, we do it. We find excuses as to why it's okay for us to live one day. Okay, So, let's look at uh, uh, another question here. What are you waiting for to be happy? What has to happen for you to be happy? This might seem like it's a different question, but I think it actually is related. What would have to happen for you to be perfectly happy, fully content right now? You're looking at me smiling. <laughs> do you, <laughs> you, uh, you want our answers? Do what? You want yes, this is not a rhetorical question. This is an answer. This is a question. I, I think, I mean, like, of course, I, I've, you know, thought about this for a while. But I think I'd be a lot happier if I was on the mission still. Okay. I mean, what about it? Of course, still is a mission still, but I mean more like, I, I really like the idea of going to other countries. I feel like other places are more, I don't know, like miracles here in the United States, you don't really see them very much because, well, they're so over talked about, I guess. I don't know what you think. And in other countries, I feel they're more innocent to it, to the okay. gospel. And so if you say, hey, let's pray for your um, mom to get healed from the sickness, they're like, oh yeah, Jesus is going to heal them. And you come back the next day, they're like, so how's your mom? Oh, God healed her, duh. You told me to pray, and she, I prayed, and she's healed. You know? <laughs> they're more innocent to the gospel. And so I feel like... And then also, I feel like in other countries, they don't have the uh, access to the Bible and to Christian things like we do in America, so I feel like they need me more. And, I don't know, I just feel like they could do more other places. Okay. All right. Anybody else? What are you waiting for to be happy? What has to happen for you to be happy? Like a lot of times in life, we, we spend a lot of time wishing we were happy, but we don't ever stop and ask the question, so what has to happen for us to be happy? What, what are we waiting for? Well, I'll, I'll give kind of an example for this. Like, I used to, like, buy new CDs, like, all the time. Like, all the time. As it should be. And so, like, I was always waiting for that that new CD to come out, you know, like anticipating getting it in my grip, in my grasp, you know, and then I mean, you you put it aside and you've got it now, so so what's the next one? Well, now you go for the next one, you know, and I think a lot of times in life that's kind of how we live, you know, right. like we think, well, if if I achieve this, then I'm going to be happy, right? You know? But we get there and we find that that's not really where our fulfillment is. Yeah. And so then we start looking for something else. No. I think that it works on a bigger scale, too, than just the small things. You know, I think that 
after we hem haw around with the little things in life, we eventually yeah. set our eyes on something bigger. Bigger, yeah. bigger, you know? bigger. Um, like for instance, a lot of people who who weren't happy as kids you know, or weren't happy in their young adult life, they go and try and get a career, and then that doesn't make them happy. So then they get married, and that didn't make them happy. So then they think, if I have kids, that'll fulfill me. And they get distracted for a while because babies take a lot of time. <laughs> right. But then by the and time the kids the, grow up, yeah. Then by the time the kid reaches about ten or so, you realize, holy crap, and this was just a distraction. I'm still not happy. Yeah. Well, any other ideas of what would it take for me to be happy? If anybody wants to say anything while I'm going, you just and I'll stop. Okay. So I don't want to make anybody feel awkward, but I also don't want to ignore anybody. So. For most, happiness and contentment is something off in the distance, something they are pursuing. What do you think would make you happy and content? Kind of a rewording of that question. Most of the time, I, I will say this, most of the time people have this mindset. It's something something off. The, in fact, Will Smith had a movie that was actually called The Pursuit of Happiness. That I have to pursue it. It's something out there somewhere that I, I, I have to... You know, I really, I really like the title of that movie. I think it's just a great title. I guess what gets me the most is I just wish I had more time. You know what I mean? Four hours in a day. Uh, you're old now. Just <laughs> kidding. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel like a lot to me, like day to day, it's like oh, I wish I had more time to do this. I wish I had more time to do that. I wish I had more time to, you know, organize this thing and that thing. And, uh, I don't know. There is more time. There's <laughs> I know for me, just something would just be able to provide for myself. You know, be able to live by myself, be able to provide, and not really have to depend on everybody else to do what I should be doing. I gotcha. I understand that place. I was ready to move out at 15. I was like, can I get this <laughs> more? You'll be have to be, uh, uh, just don't have to worry about anything. Okay. Just uh, take care of stuff. But don't have, have no worries. So basically, if, if responsibilities were removed. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. What if I was to say, happiness is an effect, not something that can be pursued. No. Happiness is a byproduct. But then that brings up the question, a byproduct of what? Yeah. What has to happen for that byproduct to arrive? <laughs> and that, that is the question. Is it a byproduct of our emotions? Is it a byproduct of our emotions? <laughs> isn't, emo isn't happiness itself an emotion? Yeah. I mean, think about it. Even those of us who are most sure of our log logic and our reason, this can never fail me, it's always that nagging thing in the back of your head that's there. And I have here in a footnote, this is something I had to learn the hard way. A heart that is at war with itself will yield a life that is at war. Basically, if your heart is not at peace, if you have not accepted who you are and where you are, nothing else will matter. You will always be at war. This is actually a Chinese principle uh, that I kind of adapted and uh, I really think that it, it's onto something there. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I've, I've read scripture, I've looked at what Jesus had to say, and I think that that's pretty much pretty right on. And we're going to look at some scriptures, but not yet. Um, there's an the idea there that I can resolve the tension that exists within my own soul by changing the things around. Let me give you an analogy. Let's say there's a walled city. 
and that city is on fire. And so the king of that city decides outside of the city, outside of the wall, to start building orchards. That's not going to do anything for the fire in the city, is it? No. It's going to continue to burn. Yeah. And the city is going to continue to fall apart, right? Right. That is why we cannot look to things to make us happy. Because if our soul is not at rest, changing everything else will never make it at rest. So let's look at some, at some more stuff here. First, I want to say this before we get into um, our individual worth, and I think that that's uniquely tied in here. Um, our happiness is never going to be found in work. What do you hear so much? The the what do they call it? The mantra of my generation. The the slogan. I don't, I, that, there's a saint. There's a word. That there's the uh, the chant. The uh, ah, anyways of my generation is find a job you enjoy. <laughs> Find something that fulfills you, but that's a that's a conundrum because work is never meant to satisfy us. In fact, it shouldn't satisfy us. That's not healthy. If our work makes us happy, that's bad. <laughs> that means the curse that God gave us has we have turned into the entire revolution of our life is around this work. What are you gonna say? Yeah, uh, Jason actually was working with a woman. Uh, I, I don't know if it was in Canada or while he was in Georgia, but she was going through this. She wasn't happy, you know, working. And he, he told her this. He's like, work is a curse. It's, it's not supposed to make you happy. He's right. like, you just do it because you have to. Yeah. Right. I mean, you can like it, but not... Uh, yeah, well, it's not where you get your fulfillment. Right, right. and that's what, I'm, that's what I'm contrasting. If you like your job, that's fine. What I'm talking about is where it's your pursuit. It's, it's all... Yes, all-consuming. Uh, ministry also doesn't satisfy. It doesn't. I've always, I've always thought, you know, when I, was, when I was younger, I was always working towards something. You know what I mean? I, I had a direction in life. I knew what my purpose was and everything. I went to college. It was just another step, and I, I understood that. I, I mean, I was going to go out and do great things. I was going to be a world changer, right? And then you get out of college, and, and life doesn't suddenly transform. And I think that was the biggest surprise, is that life is still life. But I graduated, but life is still life. Right. And so you're hit with this. It's like uh, in the book he describes it. As uh, on the movie Perfect Storm, where he has to bail from his helicopter, and he lands in, in the ocean water, and he smacks it really hard. And that's kind of like what happens with life. We smack it real hard, and it just throws us a little bit off our game. We're a little bit confused, a little bit dazed, and uh, we spend most of our young adult life trying to get reoriented. And this isn't something that one person goes through. This is something that everybody goes through. It lasts from about the time you're about 17 all the way till you're about 48. 50, yeah. somewhere in there. And then you start going to this other stage where you realize that you're at the la latter parts of your life and you start to get more of a, a hopeless idea. Um, you start to get more, de more detached. And we're not going to look at that because this is a young adult meeting, <laughs> not, a, not a midlife meeting. Um, you know, and so we start going through different stages of, of, of just denial that this is actually happening in our life. Like, this, this, this can't be what's going on. And uh, so we look for these different things, and it just doesn't satisfy. And so we think maybe if we change the things and we keep doing this, but our heart is still at war with itself. And our soul is still in a place of burning. And so we try and ignore this fact by maybe if all the other things change, that fire will go out, and it doesn't. Some of us are lucky enough to, 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 to realize this before we do things like waste our money on stuff, waste our time on stuff, sleep around and party every weekend. Some of us are lucky enough to do that. But for a lot of young adults, we never quite reach that place of, ah, <laughs> bring <laughs> enlightenment. Uh, money or things, or the pursuit of money or things. Right. I either think, like, Chuck brought this up with CDs. That's a, yeah. I mean, obviously people say, well, that's just a smaller scale thing. Well, yeah, but it's, it's it yeah. is indicative of a larger yeah. scale problem. Um, and friends also, friends and family. You see, you see people do this. Oh, I, I get my happiness from friends and family. Well, what when? You, what about when you're not around your friends and family? Right. Then I'm not happy. <laughs> what about when, what about when they die? Yeah. What about when when you when you're left like at nighttime when you have to go to bed by yourself? You know, right. it, it, well, we all cuddle together. <laughs> you know, I mean, in a healthy in a healthy environment. Children should leave the nest. You know, that, that's a healthy thing that happens. It's not like a bad thing. Um, and yet the question remains, why am I not happy? 
Which brings, I think, to the main question that is really at the heart of all of this. Do you believe your individual life really matters in the cosmic scale? This is not this is not an actual question. This is a rhetorical question. This is something for you to ask yourself. Do you genuinely believe that your individual one life matters in the grand scheme of things? Ask yourself this and be real with yourself. Oftentimes we try to compensate our, our feelings of inadequacy by just saying, you know, giving ourselves different excuses, but stop and really be real with yourself. We're talking about the entire world here. We're talking about, you know, we're on the verge of nuclear war with North Korea. We're at the verge of, you know, being burned. You know, a whole northwest of America is being is on fire. We're, uh, hurricanes after hurricanes. Mexico City had a uh, 8.1 uh, earthquake. earthquake or uh, magnitude earthquake uh, and uh, you know we have all these all these terrible things flooding in India uh, overpopulation in some places uh, government crackdowns on different things like religion what can your life really accomplish and we're faced face with that question what do you really believe your life is worth which brings us to I think a question that can't be separated from this question what did Jesus why did Jesus die what was the real reason as for his death? And if I ask you guys, the first thing that pops into your life, into your mind is to save us, right? Yeah. So that we'll go to heaven. Right. That's what we've been told that uh, the salvation completely revolves around. But yes. what if that was wrong? That that would totally totally blow your mind, wouldn't it? Let's look at some scripture. Isaiah 61:1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Nowhere in there did he say to weasel you into heaven. Nowhere in there did he say so that when you've lived out your miserable life, and you've gone through the terrible terror of dying, you know where you're going. That wasn't even mentioned once. Look what is mentioned. To bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted. Yet most of us live our life brokenhearted because that's just life. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Would you say you're bound right now? Constantly weighs on your heart, you're not happy? That's being bound if there's anything that is being bound. And the opening of the prison to the... I'm sorry, I already read that one. Liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Yeah. Um, so the first thing, Jesus died for you, not for a principle. Not for an idea, for you individually. And if it was just for you individually, he still would have done it. Because he came to set captives free. That means you, by yourself, are important to God. That means your importance is not tied to anything that you could later become or could later do. Your importance is tied to the fact that God sees you as important. That's it. That means if you never accomplished any grand thing in your eyes, that God wouldn't love you any less. That's a pretty powerful statement because everything in our culture tells us that we have to prove our worth. Right. We have to. We love. We marry somebody not for who they are. We marry them for what we hope that one day they will be. Honestly, we like to lie to ourselves. We like to pretend to ourselves. But yet, why do we have fights with our spouses? Because they do something we don't like. They don't well, did they suddenly them. change after we married them? Well, no. But we'd like for them to change that thing, right? Uh -huh. We married them for who they could be. Who we were romanticized in our head that they would be. Not for who they actually were. You know what I mean? Not for who they actually were. Romans 5.17 For if because of one man's trespass... Death reigned through the, that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness 
reign in in what? Life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Death is no longer the central theme of life. What changed it from death being the central theme to life being the central theme? Jesus. Once again, not for the sole reason of being saved. Once again, not for the sole reason of being saved, but to have life. We're talking about something much bigger than simple salvation. And I think that because of our getting used to disappointment, we limit salvation to that one thing of salvation. Okay, let's keep going. Matthew 12, 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Now hold on. That would mean that we are good. Right? That would mean that we are good. Because how could we produce good fruit if we were a bad tree? But yet, what do you hear people tell us so much about our nature that we are evil, right? Yeah. We were evil, but then Jesus. Now, this gets a little bit complicated, and I'm not. And there is a heresy going on that's real close to what I'm saying. So I'm going to try and give you give you as much clarity as possible. We're going to look at this and just saying, but yes, we do still make mistakes. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. But Romans one starts out: all our all our sinners all have sinned, right? And the point that Paul is trying to make is that everybody needs salvation. But that's not where Romans ends at. Roman then goes on, Romans then goes on to show about how Jesus, through his sacrifice, atoned for us, making us good. But then he goes on, through Romans 12 and whatnot, to then take that a step further. So then, don't glorify sin in your mortal bodies. That means we still have the potential for evil, and we still have... The temptation for evil. But as Jesus said here, the tree is good, and that's how we produce good fruit. We are no longer evil. Which brings us to a foundational problem in all of the Bible, the matter of evil. Genesis starts out, God made everything and it was good. It says that multiple times, it was good. But then this little thing happened called our rebellion, which separated us from God, and there's the problem. We needed to be not just saved, restored. And so then, Jesus brought not just salvation, but restoration. That includes now and then. Do you understand the difference? We don't realize the fullness of that yet until the next life, but it has begun now. Philippians says, I know that he who started a good work will be faithful to continue that. He'll, he'll see it through till the day of salvation. Right? So, let's keep going. You are good if you are saved. 1 Timothy 1.15 So, just to clarify, we do still need to confess when we sin. We do still need to trust in God. And we do still make mistakes, right? Okay. We have not reached perfection, and that's not what I'm saying at all. In fact, 1 John says that whoever says that he's not a sinner is a liar. Okay? So, let's keep things in, in balance here. 1 Timothy 1.15 The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. So, true righteousness realizes it's not based on works. What Paul was saying wasn't that he lives in sin, because that would be exactly the opposite of what Paul and John write. Rather, what he's saying is, Christ died for for me, even though there's nothing I can do to deserve it, even after I'm saved, there's nothing I can do that I can deserve it. Right. I'm the foremost of sinners. What changed it? Christ's blood, which made us good. See the difference there? There's a balance here that people go on the extremes of. For instance, he, in his book, doesn't even mention the other side of it. He only mentions the good heart. He doesn't mention anything else. So, once again, he's not a theologian. He's a, he's a Christian book writer. Well, you know some of the worst theology is found in Christian books? Oh. <laughs> Beware of quoting these more than quoting this. Beware of that. This is a general principle. When you see people like Joel Osteen mention other things and like psychology and different things over scripture, those things are all good, but they should supplement the Bible, yeah. not take the place of the Bible. So let's keep things in perspective here. 
Um, Romans 7.15. I'm marching just in Romans. Yes, I was just in Romans. Romans 7.15 says, um, For I do not... For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So that now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Well, so now we have a little bit of a conundrum, don't we? <laughs> uh, there will always be a struggle. And I just want to leave that there. There's obviously more I could say there. But really what this all comes to is the idea that you are special. As VeggieTel said... God made you very special, and God made you special, and loves you very much. Yes, that's exactly true. It's sad that we that we can find such a true teaching to children when it's something that we as adults have yet to grasp. God made you special, and He loves you very much. We know the idea that Jesus loves us, but you individually. Okay, so why would God save you if you didn't matter? Which means that you do matter in the cosmic scale. Even if you don't do anything, your works are not do not justify your value. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Your value is your value. Okay, we need to separate this because there's still this idea that our works are somehow make us more valuable to God, more indispensable, and that's what we want to get through. Ephesians three seventeen says this. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love. Is that all I was going to say? Yeah, that is all I was going to say. The, the part there that I want to emphasize, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. In a way, now don't get too carried away with this, okay? But in a way, the most holy place, the tabernacle of the Old Testament, is now in our hearts. Do you understand the importance of that? They had to have a great high priest that could only go into the most holy place once a year, and that was only to offer atonement for their sin. But now, through Christ's atonement, the veil that separated the most holy place from the holy place has been ripped right. apart, as Matthew like chapter 23 or somewhere around there says. In other words, as Hebrews says, he is our mediator before God. We don't need a priest, we don't need sacrifices, and we don't have that block anymore. But it goes a step further. It's not confined to a place on earth because as 1 Corinthians chapter like 6, I think, says, God dwells in us. That's a mighty powerful statement. That means that the tabernacle is outdated. The temple in Israel is outdated because God no longer dwells in a temple. He dwells in your heart. Right. Wow. Are you starting to see your importance now? God could have just not created humans. He could have just done away with them. You know what I mean? Our, our failure didn't didn't stop God from pursuing us throughout the years. Obviously, I'm not saying the gospel is, is us, us centered. It is God centered. But we are a key player. God said so. You know what I mean? It's not about our glory. It's about God's glory. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying everything is about us. I'm not saying that at all. It's all about God. However. God chose to make us a key character. I think that's kind of a, a big thing that we shouldn't overlook. Yeah. Okay, I think sometimes in our attempts to sound humble, we go into a realm of not actual good theology. And I want to kind of come back to that in just a second. Uh, <clears throat> some treat it, treat us as though we only have value, but uh, by what we do or could be. And I want you to understand this idea. That's not your fault. People don't see other people's value, and that's not your fault. Being mistreated by by your parents when you were a kid, that's not your fault. Being mistreated by by your siblings when you were a kid, that's not your fault either. Being mistreated in high school, that's not your fault. People don't see the value of other people, that's not your fault. I think that this is something we need to come, come to grips with. Some things happen to us, some people treat us as wrong. Our culture teaches us about our value, and that just it's not our fault. We need to stop letting things define our our worth and let God define our worth. Okay? Because it's not your fault. We weren't created to be efficient. God did not create us, nor did he save us, for how much we could do. I really want you to understand this, because somewhere along getting saved, we make it all about being efficient. God created me so I can get all this stuff done. No, he could do it without you. 
His plan, his eternal plan is not contingent on you. You see what I mean? He will accomplish his purposes. He didn't create you to be efficient. So many pastors nowadays live as though their whole job is to be efficient. Isn't that the whole purpose of the Sabbath? To take a break from being efficient? To take a break from that? What was the purpose that Israel did all those fe all those festivals and all those those sacrifices? What a waste of time. They should have been more efficient reaching out to... or, or No. God didn't create us to be efficient. It's not how much better can I, can I do at my job. It's not how can I revolve my whole life around my job. It's about God. And that was the idea of the Sabbath, so that you can remember that I am the Lord. That's what Exodus says. Take the Sabbath so you can rem remember that I am the Lord who saved you. The implication there is that by not following the Sabbath, they were not able to remember that he was God and they were rejecting him as God. That's the implication. So, um, we also weren't saved for what we could be. God didn't save us for what we could be in his kingdom. I want you to kind of grasp what I'm saying here. God didn't save us for what we could be in his kingdom. So often we apply our works, our abilities, to our salvation. See what I mean? We tie our happiness to where we could be. We tie everything to, to, to works. We teach that we are saved by works even though we deny it. See what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So, that means that true happiness must be a byproduct of seeking God. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, seeking God. Happiness is a byproduct of seeking God. So, just to clarify, what I'm saying is that there is never a job or ministry or anything else that will ever come by that will make that happiness. God makes the happiness, and as we seek after God, the byproduct is happiness. Right? That's the byproduct of seeking after God and <coughs> trusting in Him with our, our whole lives. What's the difference between, between somebody who professes Christianity and rejoices when they have cancer and somebody who professes Christianity and weeps while they have cancer? The joy of the Lord, <coughs> right? It surpasses all understanding, and it comes from seeking him, right? Right? Okay. Now, obviously, um, no, I don't really want to say that, so I'm not going to. Um, God loves us, so he works in us. God works in us not because he doesn't love us as we are. He works in us because he loves us. God loves us to such a degree that he, he's not okay with us being left alone in our sin. He wants us to improve. He wants us to feel better, to do better, to be better. Right? And, but that's exactly what salvation is, restoration of not just our spirit, of our body too. First Timothy says this, But the wife is going to be restored through childbearing. What childbearing? The childbearing of Jesus Christ. Through the process of Jesus' birth, the wife has been restored by the blood of Christ. In other words, when we sinned in the Garden of Eden, woman lost her place, and she became dominated by man. And then, through Christ's death, through childbirth, she was restored in her place. To now, there is no longer a slave and a free a man and a woman, a Jew and a Gentile. The reason why Christian women have equality with Christian men is because of the blood of Christ. God has restored the place of the woman. Now, why would that matter if he just came to save us? He didn't just came to save us. He came to restore us. And we need to stop looking for, for wholeness and restoration out there somewhere. We need to rest in his restoration now. Right? Okay. Um, God cares more for our relationship with him than our accomplishments. God cares more for our relationship with him than our accomplishments. In fact, the most good you can ever do and the most God will ever speak to you is when you're when you're when you're seeking after him. What were the apostles doing in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit fell on them? They were praying. They were seeking God. They were, seeking God. They were praying. They were studying the scriptures. They weren't doing anything. They were seeking God. And because they were seeking after God, he equipped them to do. 
Works flow from that. We don't have to pursue the works. Works flow from our relationship with God. If you are in a place where you don't feel like you're doing something, seek after God. He can change things. But don't seek after God so that he changes things. Seek after God so that you can know him more. Because that's what the Sabbath says in Exodus. So that you may know me. During the Sabbath was so that they could know him. Okay? Um, so let's look at some things towards happiness. Yeah, or finding happiness, I should say. Matthew 13, 15. And we're getting towards the end of this. It won't be much longer now. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Okay? Not save, heal. Heal and restoration includes salvation, but it's not limited to salvation. See what I mean? We've been reading only parts of the Bible that make us accept the fact that we've accepted hopelessness in our life. We weren't meant to live hopeless. We were supposed to live in joy now. Satan whispers nonsense in our hearts and we believe it. And we let our culture mold us. You're fat. You're worthless. You need to try harder. You need to get a better job. You need to do better in your ministry. You need to get a different ministry. You need to run around like a chicken with, a, with its head cut off. Satan whispers these little things. We just cling on to it. Right. I think partly because we want to cling on to it. We kind of want there to be some truth in what Satan tells us. We think somehow it, it, it justifies our, our feeling of an, an uneasiness. See what I mean? And then we justify, we, we, we further justified it by saying, this was never meant to be our home. I agree, but that was also a minor point in the New Testament. The major theme of the New Testament was being alive. So let's kind of keep things in perspective there. <clears throat> and then we let our culture mold us, but I've already looked at that. So this is what shame says. I'm nothing to look at. I'm not capable of goodness. My ministry is just, you know, it's just, it's, you know, that's what shame says. And we, we convince ourselves that that's humility. But this is true humility. Christ has made me what I am. I owe it all to him. One is dependent on Christ. One is dependent on me. Notice the theme of shame. It's all about me. I'm nothing to look at. I am a failure. I just, I just do it for this reason. It's all about shaming yourself. And then we convince ourselves that that's humility. That's not humility because humility... What is humility? Being lowly of spirit? Well, in a way. But humility is... Now, understand what I'm saying here, okay? Humility is emphasis on Christ. It is comparison of your character to Christ. It is comparison of your life and your goals to Christ. It is your wholehearted pursuit on Christ. And Christ changes your heart. Shame says, I need to try and be humble. Or else pride's going to get a hold. Humility says, I need to try and be like Christ. Or else pride's going to get a hold. See the difference? Yeah. It's all about your pursuit. What are your eyes fixed on? Christ or your lowliness? Christ or making sure that the attention isn't on you? Because I'm pretty sure that Peter, ha Peter, all the all the attention was on him as he as three thousand people got saved in one day. Uh -huh. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure Acts two says that everybody was paying attention to Peter while he was preaching, and uh -huh. three thousand people got saved in one day. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter if the attention is or is not on you. That's not even a factor. What matters is that your heart is set on Christ, and he will change your heart, and he will help you through the times of pride. Because, newsflash, we all struggle with pride in our lives. It's in each one of us. Even the people who think, oh, that's not my main problem. Maybe it's not your main problem, but it's still there. And it will creep up with its ugly little head. Why do you think that when, in the middle of a barbecue, your mind remi reminds you of this one time in, in third grade when you did this really stupid thing, and you just want to stab your eye out? Why do you think that happens? Because of pride. It hurts ourselves when we remember how stupid we were in high school. It's like, oh, because we're prideful. That's just who we are. You know, and it's, it's a part of who we are. And, and, sh and focusing on not being prideful doesn't make us any less prideful. <laughs> that makes us shame ourselves for our pride. Focusing on Christ is a way that God starts changing our pride. Okay? That's not the same as sitting back and just accepting the fact that you're a prideful person. That's looking to something bigger than you to handle it. There's a big difference there, okay? So, moving on. 
Uh, these are just a few of the examples, and I'll just go through them very quickly. Philippians 4.4. I can actually find Philippians. Come on. Ah, it's Galatians. Okay, I'm 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 lost here, guys. It's before Colossians? Yeah, ha oh, ha, there it is. Philippians 4 4 Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. That's now. James 1 2. I might not have to turn there. I know it by heart. Uh I brain farted, I don't know. Never mind, I don't know it by heart at this moment. <laughs> Ask me any other time and I know it by heart. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Yes, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Well, that's one heck of a statement. And in fact, if you're interested, Chuck's going to preach on it next uh, month. I think that's like the... I don't know the exact date, but it's the second Sunday in the second evening. Sunday. I, don't, I don't know the exact date. You know, I don't know. John 10.10, 10, I don't have to turn there. The, enemy, the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I come so you may have life. Abundantly. Fully. Now. I'm talking about now. Uh, and then John 7, 38. Ugh, I hate it when it wrinkles the page. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This is, once again, speaking of our life. Psalm 27, 13. This is a theme that's all throughout the Bible, but for whatever reason, we ignore it. It's not important that we're happy and content and joyful in this life, as long as we know where we're going. Psalm 27, 13. Yes, that was sarcasm, by the way. Uh, this is which says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This side of death. And then verse 14, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. I'll just wait until I die. No, now. I believe I'll see it now. Okay, now I, I'm not trying to preach a, a here and now prosperity kind of, you know, preach and proclaim it like Joel has seen in those kinds of, what are they called, uh, goodness teachers or no, uh, prosperity, prosperity teachers. Te I'm not teaching that at all. Mm -hmm. But I am saying that regardless of the situations, regardless of the hell that you have to go through, you can still be happy as a byproduct of seeking after the Lord. Don't seek the happiness. You'll never find it. Seek the Lord and he will make you happy. Luke, um, or you can spend your whole life uh, faking that if you just changed one more thing. You go ahead and do that, but I tell you, you'll wind up an old, miserable person. You're never going to find it. Luke 18, 29, 30. Or you can be happy now. I mean, that sounds like a good idea to me. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom, so basically thrown their whole life away, who will not receive many times more in this, in, in this time and in the age to come. Did he say that? Yes, he did. In this time you will receive more. In this life, you will receive more. Plus, there's also the next life. That's not the, the only thing. That's an extra added bonus. Um, Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Walk in newness of life. Remember that when you let your heart allow you to walk in deadness. Walk in newness of life. Um, obviously, not trying to say to be self-centered. If it doesn't bring freedom and it doesn't bring life, it's not Christianity. If it doesn't restore the image of God and rejoice in the heart, it is not Christianity, and that's absolutely true. That's a direct quote from this book. I totally agree with that. The problem is we take that and we then make it self-centered. My life is all about my happiness, and that's exactly the opposite of what I've been trying to say. If it doesn't bring freedom, not just to you, to you and others, that means that you can't act however you want because that's not true freedom. True freedom is living by God and God's laws and being a good example to other people so that they can walk in freedom too. See? Um, and, and if it doesn't bring life, that's all the gospel. That is the good news, that we were dead and now we are alive. That is the good news. And as if that's not good enough, when we die, we have another eternity. Literally, we have eternity to live in joy, never, never again tasting pain and sorrow. That sounds like a pretty good deal. But we don't have to wait. So... Um, not just for you, self-centeredness isn't Christianity. I already kind of said that. Absolutely. 
Um, any any gospel that's all about self is not the gospel. Well, if people offend you, you got to distance yourself from from them. If if people are if people treat you wrong, you you get them out of your life. If if people treat you wrong, you get them back. You 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 shut them out. You do whatever is necessary to make sure you're never mistreated. That's not the gospel. That's self-centeredness. Okay. Just because, see, what we do is, is if we ever taste even a fraction of happiness, we're so scared that we're going to lose it, then we make sure to attack everybody and everything that could ever come against our happiness because we've got to hold on to it. But here's here's the little kicker, okay? If you try to hold on to your happiness, you will lose it. Yeah. Jesus said it like this, He who holds on to his life will lose it, but he who abandons his life will gain it. That doesn't just apply to death. It also applies to death. Being dead to self, okay? And as long as we seek the pleasures of this world, you know, some people think that one day, if there are just no more problems, they'd be happy in this life. Some people think, if I was just free from responsibility, did you know that the more breaks you take in life, the less happy those breaks will make you? Yeah. Quit your job, okay? Quit your job and only sit around all day and just do things that make you happy. <laughs> Notice how quickly you will get bored and those things will become like driving nails into your head, okay? They will never bring that same level of joy. No! Because that's the temporary kind of joy. I'm talking about happiness that's deeper than that. Distraction, depression, burnout, these are all things that are worsened by self-centeredness. And the problem is we don't think so because we, we're trying to hold on to our happiness, which is self-centered. So we just allow the further distractions, further depression, further burnout, which just causes it to repeat itself. So we sink deeper and deeper into our state of dissatisfaction in life and we are oblivious to the fact of that we are causing our own problem right so um, so how do we become happy <laughs> accept situations don't live in what ifs this is where you are now don't worry about tomorrow this is where you are now accept that accept it there will always be greener grass there will always be greener grass I'm not saying that the grass isn't greener on the other side sometimes it is greener on the other side that, for instance, the people who are in the midst of, of the fires in Oregon, the grass is greener here because we don't have any fires. I'm not denying that. There are places where the grass is greener. Right. But there will always be places with greener grass. That's what I'm saying. But that's their grass. <laughs> you know what I mean. No, I know what you're grass. saying. I, <laughs> I know what you're saying. That's funny. I like that. Do you, do you guys get the difference that I'm saying there? Yeah. Because some people just ignore the truth. Well, you just think that it's better there because you're not there. Well, yes, but there are actually better places. For instance, Louisiana has the worst ranked school system in all of the United States. Guess what? The the school system's gra grass is definitely greener in any of the other states because their school system sucks in Louisiana. You see what I mean? Sometimes there is gr greener grass somewhere, but there will always be greener grass somewhere. You can either pursue the greener grass or you can be content with where you are. As for me, I'd rather be content than keep chasing emotional highs. Okay? So, accept situations, don't live in the wettest, but still live. Still live your life. Still accomplish things. Still do things. That's great. That's not, I'm, not, I'm not encouraging you to sit on your butt and do nothing all day. Still do things. Still live your life. But accept the situations and don't live in what ifs. Don't live your life for the pleasures of the world. For instance, living undisciplined. If it's 10 o'clock in the morning, you need to be dressed up. You're not going to find happiness that way. You, you need to, you know, you need to, for lack of a better word, be up and up. Be up and up. Waking up whenever you feel like it. This is something that, that's just not going to make us happy. Drinking and partying, that's not going to make us happy. Uh, wasting your days, that's not going to make us happy. Video games all the time, that's not going to make you happy. Television, I know a lot of housewives who watch television all day. Or... Contrarily, if the man's the one working, then house husbands. Um, working too hard, making your whole life revolve around your job. Um, wh when you're doing things like waiting at the doctor and stuff, when you're doing stuff like wait like doing your taxes, let me come back to that. Pray fast and stay in the Word. Not books about the Word, the Word. This will make you happy. So, okay, let, let's break this down. First thing I said was accept where you are. Second thing I said, still live your life. Because if you're not living life, you will not be happy. Okay. Third thing I said was don't live for the pleasures of the world, the passing things. Right? Don't make that what your whole heart and your whole mindset is revolved around. 
Fourth thing I said was pray fast and stay in the Word. Books about the Word are great. I, I have a lot of them in my office, but they don't beat the Bible. Well, I know the Bible. I've read it through before. Yeah, maybe you should keep on reading it through and keep on studying it. And then on the side, read the book. So, um, but then the next thing there. Okay, and then the next thing. Uh, worship God and thank him. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Really, I think, directly relate. Again, I can't find this book. It's before Colossians. How many times do I have to remember that? Golly. I have memorized where all the books of the Bible were, by the way. I just, it's been a long time since then. I'm not a kid anymore, I guess. Philippians 4, uh, 11 through 13 says this. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. What? Contentness all the time? Yes. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. I know how to stay where I am and how to go somewhere else. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things to him who strengthens me. God will give me grace in the moment if I trust him to give me grace in the moment. If you see God, that's it. He will give you the grace to get through the moment. We need to make our lives not about the things, not about the doing. We need to make it about God, right? Um, so, um, and then the last step here, choose to enjoy things. You know, give yourself permission, conscious permission to actually enjoy life. Acknowledge this is where I am and then say, you know what, and that's okay. It's all right. You know what I mean? Um, one of the things Pastor and I was talking about, were talking about, was talking about, was talking about, was, um, that sometimes as, as pastors you get this idea that you know oh, I'm just at this small town church and I, you know it's just a waste of time my time a waste of their time I'm not doing, doing anybody any good just give yourself permission to accept that yeah I'm at a, I'm serving a small church that's okay it's okay to enjoy where you're at you don't always have to be living in the tomorrow and the you know what I mean like living in the frustrations of life that that your manuscript can't be turned in that you might have to work more shifts than than you ha than you were having to you know that, that you don't get to do the things that you wanted to that you know you have to live with your parents that you have to go through the through the kit and through the treatments with the kidney and possibly finding another kidney you know all that stuff live in the moment accept where you are and just be okay with that yeah these are the messy situations that we found ourselves in but it's where you're actually at accept that accept it because whining and complaining about it is not going to do anything. You know what I mean? The Israelites in Exodus, they whine and complain because they're because they're not, you know, they have to go through the desert. Then they're at Mount Sinai, Sinai and then they complain because Moses is taking too long. So then they finally get to the promised land and they complain because they got to conquer it. So then they, he says, you can't go into the promised land in numbers, and then they complain about that. See what I mean? Just come, they found situations to complain about because it wasn't about all the stuff out there. It was, it was in their heart. You know what I mean? You will either find ways to be content where you are, or you will find ways to never be content. And our mind works kind of like a, a, a field of weeds. Walk the same path a hundred times, and guess what? There's going to be a path there. You're going to work a path through that field of weeds. But what happens if you make a different path? Eventually, that path will go away. See, we've conditioned ourselves to not be happy with where we're at. We've conditioned ourselves to think that it's all about our works. That's a line that's in the in the field of our of our mind. It's going to take us some time of changing our thoughts before we accept the fact of where we're at and be content with where we're at. It's not going to be like one day you're going to wake up unconsciously and think that's all right. It's going to be something that you have to work for, seeking after God on a daily basis. So once again, give yourself permission, conscious permission, to accept where you're at and to enjoy it. This is where I'm at. When you're waiting at the doctor, when you're doing the taxes, like I was saying, your life is what you make it. We don't always have good situations that we find ourselves in. We don't always have fun things that we're in. But our life is more than entertainment, right? So make it what, make it what you want it, what you want it to be. And the question of the week that I want you to add on to the questions the question of the week from last week: What traditions do you feel are ignored but shouldn't be, or vice versa? Traditions that you feel um, uh, shouldn't be ignored. Wait, let me say that. Yeah. 
yeah, shouldn't be ignored, but are ignored. Yeah. Maybe something that another another denomination does that we don't. Maybe something that, that we do that you feel like we shouldn't. You know, really delve into those. What denominations do you have experience with? Personal experience with that you've gone to. Okay. I know me personally. I've been. Um, I'm familiar with um, the Catholic Church. I'm familiar with the Pentecostal. A lot of the different Pentecostal churches, like Fort Foursquare and that kind of stuff. Um, I'm familiar with um, Baptist. Not not Southern Baptist. You know the the real moving churches. Oh, I went to one of those. I, I I've never I never been one. Um, actually, to be to be honest, I was a little bit too scared. It, all the good ones are. Um, <laughs> it was really good though. <laughs> yeah, I've always been too afraid because I thought, you know, what if they made me dance or something? I didn't want to. Felt do like that. Cream, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm not racist, okay? I just I feel like sometimes I wouldn't fit into some places. <laughs> uh, but Mama always said that I wish I was black. <laughs> So what denominations do you have experience with? Just just uh, let these things really uh, be in your mind, be in your heart, and think about them. And if, once again, if you, if you have any of these questions, please, please, please ask them before the lesson or bring them at night, but preferably ask them before so that I can have an answer in the lesson. Okay? And then also I want you to think about this. Are traditions bad? Okay, just think about that. Okay? Any questions, comments? If you don't have anything else to do, I would recommend reading this too. You know, once again, though, make sure you have a firm grasp on what the Bible actually says, because this guy's theology is woo -woo, out there. You know, they're really just not uh, just some things in there. For instance, I mean, just a few things here. He made the whole spiritual warfare thing. It's like this whole second half of the book, and he goes dark places on that. Um, and then the whole he, he only mentions our light side. He never once mentions our dark side. You know, and then what other people do people do is they try to overcompensate by then saying, well, our skin, our flesh, it's evil, but our spirit is good. And that's not really what the Bible says. The Bible says that we are one person. Okay? One person. Our body cannot be separated from our spirit. <laughs> well, hold on. When we die, won't our spirit go to heaven and our, and our body not? Until the resurrection, in which case the body will be perfected.